Hello, I'm Chris Blask, Vice President of Strategy at Cybeats, and I'll be your moderator today for the State of Cybersecurity Industry Panel uh, brought to you by Cybeats. Today's topic is the value of linked attestations in supply chains, one of my favorite. Joining us today is Virginia Wright. Ginger uh, is the Program Manager at Idaho National Laboratories for Citrix and one of the great minds in the industry. Hello, Ginger. Hi, you're right. Hi, Chris. Right. How are you doing? I'm lovely. How are you? I'm great. I love to look at Florida through your camera. Thank you. Yeah, we're up. Uh, we're in uh, uh, north of Fort Lauderdale, uh, working our way up to up the intracoastal of Pompano and so forth. And also, Mehdi Antazari. Mehdi is at uh, Unisys, where he's been for many, many years. I mean, many. My God, Mehdi. And uh, does a, a lot of things, including my uh, my co-partner or whatever in coming up with the D-bomb thing that has gotten us into this big mess of attestations in the first place. How you doing, Mehdi? Hello, everyone. Hi, Chris. Hi, Ginger. And uh, happy to join this conversation. And yes, I have been with Unisys uh, actually 30, uh, just celebrated 38th year yesterday with Unisys. So. <laughs> you got to go for 40. It's a round number. Yeah, I got to go for 40. <laughs> right. So with in, in the, uh, in the, normal world of, of business and getting things done. Uh, Andrew Hamilton from the National Manufacturing Institute of Scotland was supposed to be with us today, but has gone ill and can't be with us. So being tricksy people, we got Joshua Marpet, uh, who knows a lot about this topic, and he was going to be with us, but he decided to be having a baby right now this moment. So best of luck to both those folks. So instead, the three of us who can talk and do about this exact topic for hours and hours and hours are going to talk for one hour uh, today. So the event overview, let me give the background of this. So the, as written in the description for this session, the, the adoption of software bill of materials or SBOM is forcing organizations to better define existing business relationships. As these organizations attest more clearly in regards to their business activities, automation proves to offer benefits outside of just security in the supply chain. Today, our panelists will discuss these benefits and the steps necessary to realize them. So, again, you know, the three of us, you know, literally quite often the three of us together and the three of us in various contexts have been discussing exactly these issues for uh, a long time now. And, you know, the, the, it, it, with Cybeats, we've had 10 now, I think, of these webinars. We've had 25, maybe 30 of the, uh, the weekly conversations with Folks like you two, I mean, people who've been around for a long time have really highly developed uh, uh, views of supply chain security and software and inventory and all these wonderful things. Inside that group, there's this group, there's the D-bomb group, you know, the attestation sharing that next level of linking things together. Um, and with both of your contexts, with everything we talked about and, you know, with a uh, with a nod to Andrew and what uh, National Manufacturing Institute of Scotland or NMIS has been doing. I want to talk about one of their use cases. But I'd like to take this conversation around the benefits of, you know, security benefits, yes. But Ginger, as the Department of Energy, as Idaho National Labs, as part of the National Lab System, you, understanding what, what we're trying to achieve in just the supply chain part of the Cit Citrix program. Uh, just before you joined the, the green room, I was saying to Medi, I love the Citrix use case. And Cybeats Cy might join Citrix. We were just thinking about that as something interesting we can do. Why not, right? Get our software into that same system because everything's related. But this idea that we're going to create pools of attestations between organizations, and they may be deep on channels, they may be written on hybrid lists on the backside of dark moons, who knows? But we're going to better and better define the attestations about the things we're doing, and then okay. theor theoretically, let me we'll take link a minute, these please, and talk about the the Citrix use case. So Citrix stands for Cyber Testing for Resilient Industrial Control Systems, um, and this is a program sponsored by uh, Department of Energy's Caesar Office, um, and we are hoping to not only find vulnerabilities in industrial control systems, because many of us are seeking to find and fix those vulnerabilities, but also to help ensure that control systems are manufactured with an eye towards preventing those vulnerabilities in the first place, particularly where 
multiple of the vulnerabilities that we have found that have become important are common mode vulnerabilities. Um, they're vulnerabilities that weren't created by something that the original equipment manufacturer put in their own product. They came with a, a con some sort of control or some sort of binary that was added to the product and added features for the product, but also a set of vulnerabilities. And part of what Citrix is trying to understand is not only what is within the products that we test, but what are all of those subcomponents that have gotten rolled into uh, critical infrastructure software. We find in many cases that the open source developers or even some of the private companies that make those products have no idea that their work has been rolled into critical energy supply um, and they might make it differently if they knew that they were manufacturing for those environments. So that's how we started becoming interesting in or interested in what is the software bill of materials. Um, and Mehdi, I know we'll talk about this more, but also what is the hardware bill of materials? What integrated circuits comprise this device that I'm creating? Because the, the OEMs also don't create all of that hardware. How do we begin to understand that? Um, and so as a, as a tester, having access to all of that information is incredibly helpful in finding and mitigating vulnerabilities. And, and something I watched right now is, is asked in the YouTube chat, you know, what a testation is. And I think Citrix is a good example, right? You know, because, you know, the, the you know, correct me if I get this wrong, but basically the Department of Energy attests to some private vendor, we'll say Cybeats, or I think uh, Schneider is a uh, electric, is one of the publicly announced uh, Citrix partners. But the Department of, Ener the Department of Energy, this entity, attests to this other entity, Cybeats. You know, we'll take your product and we'll do these things that you just said, you know, for this purpose. And the Department of Energy works with the national labs. And there's four or five, right, you know, national labs uh, that are each separate organizations that agree to doing things. Five, six, five. And, uh, it, you know, and then they do those things and they attest to each other about doing them. So the and linking all these things together is is a, a, a power engineer at an electric co-op in Kansas being able to look at something and and without you know you know recreating a heaven and earth um find the attestation attached with that thing from the citrix program you know that, that and is i think the... linking is where we get to the meaning in the equation so it's easy for me to say hey there's a buffer overflow in this code i that that's a bad coding practice um, then I can go a little further and say, oh, well, that buffer overflow creates a vulnerability that could be exploited by an adversary. But then another attestation would be a product owner that includes that potentially vulnerable component saying, oh, OK, it's potentially vulnerable. But once it's wrapped in my product, is it still exploitable there? And what is the meaning of that exploitation? And so when you talk about linked linked attestations, I think what you mean is it's not only just someone standing up and saying one thing, I found a vulnerability, but it's a set of meaning making that also happens in the environment where others add in. Um, maybe I was able to replicate that. Yes, that is indeed a vulnerability. Or I was not able to replicate that. We don't think that's as critical as it was originally painted. Um, and so it, it gets many, many people in the conversation. Well, and yeah, yeah, many go ahead because I want to. Well, this, what I was going to add to what Ginger was saying. So, like, let's say a producer, a developer develops a piece of software, and then they attest that they have taken all the proper steps to produce that component software. But let's say um, the consumer of that software says, I would like to also ensure that certain other steps have been taken. So, they may go to the third parties, what they call you know, data enhancers and ask them to take that information that is going through the pipe, look at it, process them, and just provide a score or provide an outcome that it's trustable. Because nobody at the end, con the consumers are not going to sit down and look at all the attestations and say, oh, OK, they look good, 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 maybe. They want to automate the whole process so that at the end, they come and say, thumbs up, or the score is this. Uh, these attestations, like, you know, uh, the accumulative score is this, and you can trust it or not trust it, or you need more information. So, you know, an attestation is, is just a statement by someone about something, right? And the, the I want to run through the uh, the National Manufacturing in, uh, Institute of Scotland use case, you know, for uh, attestation insurance. I think that just illustrates really, really well. 
Um, but at the same time, because I think this one might be a little easier to understand, Turi's in Canada subcontracts to a, a, a large global uh, company that has a Canadian a government contract, and Turi's makes a little weld, a little welded you know metal brackets, little cameras. And they do make these with smart machines and so forth that are capable of attesting every time they do something, you know, to, to some, uh, you know, to some channel like a debum channel or whatnot. And they're currently, you know, so you see these mechanisms already in place. The Canadian government requires that this, you know, large contractor get attestations from their supply chain that these welds are done correctly. What that means pragmatically is that Darlene shuts down the shop for an hour. They line them all up, takes pictures with their phone, and emails them to somebody at this at this big contractor. So the attestations exist, but how on earth would you connect an individual device with one of those pictures that's been emailed somewhere? But what Andrew has been doing is you know this one, Medi, you know, what you know, the National Manufacturing Institute of Scotland has a use case. You can picture like this. You know, that I am a flight engineer, uh, an Air Force flight engineer for a country out there in the world. And I've been on the job for 23 years. And I, have in fact, worked with the team that did the acquisition of the, the plane that I'm looking at right now. I worked with the manufacturer as they built them. I know these planes inside and out. I know the tools that made them. I know the people that made them. I know everything. And I'm looking at this one turbine right here. And there's this one blade in this one turbine. And I know that there was a couple versions of the software on the radio plasma forge you know, that were used by the subcontractors during the time of the manufacture of these and one version, you know, had a tendency to cause, you know, problems, not a security thing. It's just a different version of software. And I just want to know what was the S-bomb? What's, what software was running when the subcontractor out in the world in Scotland, in this case, uh, what was the software running on that tool? I want to know. And to the, to the uh, viewer out there, the question linked attestations means that this air force has a relationship with the airframe manufacturer. They don't have a relationship with a turbine manufacturer. That's a subcontractor. They don't have a relationship with this Scottish manufacturer. That's a subcontractor. It's a subcontractor. So, but each of these pairs of, of business partners have contracts that we're testing to each other already about all sorts of things and linking these things together in automated fashion allows us to compare this. So there's a question, um, Anthony, if we have that one, what are the differences in uh, cost of this? Finding this S bomb. Sorry, the uh, um, that was Fran. Um, number one, I think. But anyways, you know. So right now, you can think about this. If, if that use case actually existed, that flight technician is on the tarmac, and they want to know what software is running on the machine tool, they can find out. You know, how, think through this. How would this work if this was really critical? They'd write it down out on the tarmac. They'd take it back to the office. They'd ask the commanding officer. They'd go back. It would take months. It would cost fifty thousand dollars, a hundred thousand. I don't know, you know, some. But sooner enough, you you throw enough people and time at it, you can find that S bomb. So linked link attestations, you know, link, linking attestation systems means linking that together with all the lawyers and and people with clipboards. Yeah, I mean, the real example is um, like Unisys, our company. They, we provide software solutions to our customers in critical infrastructure. Now, the software, some of them, the IPs are developed internally, and some of them, we get it from the suppliers, you know, other suppliers. Now, the critical infrastructure, how can they trust that every, uh, that the whole entire software, which includes pieces from other suppliers that are not even visible to them, they just get in the information that the product from Unisys. So that's what the link at the station becomes important. When Unisys, in the, as an integrator and as IP provider, puts a package together, they will ensure that uh, the supplier of some of the components can attest to what they are providing. And we build on top of that, and we attest to the other pieces that we are providing. And at the end, the end, final customer is getting one attestation. Everything is meets their requirement, whatever was agreed to uh, their uh, process. And also, um, you know, in other conversations, Ginger, you mentioned the legal becomes important. What information can you provide to your downstream customer? Because legal doesn't want sometimes to share all the information because down the road, who knows what happens? So legal can upfront get 
involved in defining what can be shared. Once you have defined the whole process of attestation sharing, then everything can nicely be automated and flow through the whole process. And that's the beauty of uh, linking attestation sharing in an automated way and trustable way. All right, yeah, so Ginger, you know, one of the questions we had for you and, and this, you know, since we're coming at this through the talk about Citrix a little bit. So Anthony, if you could put that one up, you know, can you describe the logistics of sharing supply chain information? So if I, you know, think of a lot of places start just in your work department of energy, or I'm a manufacturer, or I'm a operator, or I'm a, 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 a researcher at one of the labs as part of the Citrix program. You know, I'm getting the feeling that, that this is not all today completely automated and just goes end to end. I think there's a lot of email involved, people actually calling each other on their phone. I mean, how is this information shared today? So you're right. There is a lot of handwork that we are doing today. Um, and I'm going to describe where we are. I see a very bright future ahead. So as if this um, description is triggering for anybody here, there, once we get through this work, once we do it together, once we learn everything that we need to learn, there is a process for automation that will make this faster and better and more protected. Um, but today, um, Several suppliers are in the process of exploring how they want to provide, I'll say, software bills of materials first. They often do provide hardware bills of materials, but the channels for those two pieces of information are often distinct and separate. Um, and today, if I have a software bill of materials for my products, um, first, I have to decide what level of information am I going to share? Am I going to share um, just one degree of dependency and components that are at that one degree? Or am I going to go down and share every single thing that anything includes in my software? Does it include runtime dependencies? Does it include things that are configuration dependent that might be downloaded? I've got to make all of those decisions as a, an, as a vendor or a manufacturer. Um, and then um, I can distribute that in a couple of ways, and this is what we're seeing. Um, some of those software bills of materials are included on a vendor portal. So if I have a certain license agreement and I'm granted a certain password, I can get into the vendor portal and I can download it. Um, and if I have questions about it, I can exchange attestations with the vendor right now, but they're in private emails and it might be me emailing about hey, it has a potentially vulnerable component. Can you tell me if there's an exploit within your product for that? Is your product vulnerable? Um, and then there's a response for that, but no one else gets that response. That's a single sender, single recipient, highly manualized uh, transaction. Um, and hopefully I, on my end, am collecting all of that information and keeping that in my contracts folder uh, which may be paper, which may be digital, so that someday um, if something comes up, uh, we can say, hey, this vendor agreed to tell us within 30 days of any vulnerability that was discovered. Have they met that requirement? What evidence do we have? Um, so all of this information is currently, it's being done, but it's being done in a highly manualized way. Each vendor is doing it differently. Some of them don't have a vendor portal, and instead they provide this only on demand, only to certain customers through email or other uh, means. So it's, it's a place where automation is going to really enable our ability to communicate because today we can only have certain conversations because we only have so much time to do these highly manual operations. Right, and it's, it's the economics of time that I think drives all of this at the end of the day. Right. And you, you mentioned the contracts folder, right? You know, I see it has come up a couple of times just in this conversation. You know, the lawyers, the legal and so forth, you know, you know, specifying what it is you want access to. We do all these things all the time. You know, we create business relationships. You know, there's a people talking to each other. Um, we find a way to write that all down, create a contract. And that contract is code. And we're going through this. Uh, era of smart contracts now, you know, I think this is an inevitability we're part of over this decade, the next one or whatnot. We can expect contracts and legal terms to be not just something you check against someday, but active, you know, and instead of no, well, wondering whether or not, you know, your, your business partners are living up to their agreement, you know, they are because the contract hasn't sent you a, a notice that they aren't and you know, the automation of, of the attestations, you know, 
attest the automation of of the attestations about the things in the contract uh, just happens and so the the, the economics right you know so that, that first uh, question you know I was going to walk through with with andrew right so i love expanding this out you know with how much time do you have we don't do things well if if that was we can compress that time what are the things we could do everybody in an organization could be doing things you just you just don't do now because it takes too much time and then the economics of the things we do you know as we're doing these things it takes how much effort you know when we built cars in the 1950s we just used big slabs of metal and so forth but you know after a while materials cost uh mattered right we got efficient at it so the so anyway, let's spin this one to uh, a question number four, Anthony, if you could, you know, uh, actually to five, sorry. You know, how valuable is is the timeliness of this information to security operations centers? Right, let's turn us back and look look at uh, at security because mo you know, most of us are security folks and th that's really what we're all focusing on these days. That same logistics cost. Um, Ginger, you know, in, in, your, in your views and your experience, is it keeping information out of, you know, is the, the time and, and logistics and the speed of sharing this information keeping it out of the hands of people in socks who would have been better off having it? Is that sort of where uh, we are today? The timeliness is crucial. Um, we recently did a, a live exercise um, at an ICS conference. We had a chance to get some asset owners in the room and some vendors in the room, and we walked them through some scenarios. First, um, we made them become product manufacturers and dealt with the question of how soon would you share an attestation with your customers and what would it contain and what would you need to know in order to share it? And then we flipped the tables and made our exercise participants asset owners. Um, and what would you want from your manufacturers and how does that change your answers to the questions we asked you before? Um, and how would this work? And for all of them, um, the key thing that they want is a timely attestation to when, when a new vulnerability is discovered, they want their vendors to make a timely attestation that this vulnerability either affects the product or doesn't affect the product. It's either exploitable or it's not so that those asset owners can then begin whatever risk mitigation they do. You know, please know we, we like to get very product centric and it's easy just to think about the patches and how am I going to fix this within the product. But a lot of those asset owners have many methods of risk mitigation that they can conduct off the product. Um, maybe they change the network architecture slightly. They change a firewall configuration. They inspect packets more carefully in certain areas or they look at particular traffic. They need time to bring those mitigations into uh, place. So they want those timely attestations so that they can do the risk management planning that they've got to do. Well, it, it, yeah, it, it may, you know, I think about the same issue of timeliness, but on the code management side. So you inside Unisys, you know, been looking at attestation, node channels, ecosystems, doing POCs, implementing them and so forth because you write a lot of code. And if I'm not mistaken, you're not doing this because, you know, you like spending extra money on things that add layers, but because, you know, everybody's trying to be more efficient in code management and all that implies. And S bombs are just uh, part of this. So you were, you were going to answer apparently also, but your mic is muted. So yeah, we're going to add oh. to uh, what Ginger was saying. Sorry, mute. I was on mute. Um, the other thing is that having a good inventory of all of the components that are in your product. And when you look at like a uh, uh, developer for a software solution, they have many versions of a software and some of them might be years old and they need to have a way to know exactly what the inventory of each version of the software it is so that they can get the attest corresponding attestations for those components. And as new components are added or removed, you, you can imagine how complicated this becomes. So the entire automation by which automatically, you know, a new vulnerability, which component it affects, where those components are used in all of your product lines, and knowing even your upstream suppliers, whether they have it in their component or not, and doing it in a timely manner. Look at Log4j. You had limited time to react to it. And if you don't have that information and process that information in an automated way, you're just um, 
you're just you know not wasting time but you're just making yourself vulnerable to attacks so that's where the automation knowing the inventory and um, having the corresponding attestation is important and again adding to what ginger was saying even it's not right away i need to know whether i'm affected or not and i'm uh, i'm affected I would like to know when or how long it's going to take my supplier or even our own developers to be able to react because it may require a lot of changes to the code by which the there are, mild, there are other commitments. So you have to schedule and so, but you need to have sort of like an interaction between the suppliers of software, consumers of software in a trusted manner by which they can provide that information. So I think we are getting to the point that we're realizing these, knowing these type of information are extremely important in order to react quickly to the vulnerabilities. Um, so that's that's how we are start looking at the, in, in, we can, and actually we are walking towards it because again, attacks are increasing, the type of attacks that come, you know, are increasing, they are becoming more sophisticated. And uh, so it's, in, that's how we're looking at it, um, Chris. So, Mehdi, you know, uh, I wanted to you know, have a question uh, written for this one. So, number three, if you can, uh, Anthony, is, I would like you to actually talk about DBOM specifically. You know, mm -hmm. and again, you know, you know, it's open source now. Anybody can go to the DBOM project on GitHub and get it. Um, I'm not, you know, working with Unisys anymore. You are. There's various interests and so forth. But, you know, as I, as I try to say as often as possible, if not DBOM, something else. You know, an attestation ecosystem of channels and nodes just kind of seems absolutely you know, inevitable. So what is DBOM and how does it work? So DBOM, what is what problem is it trying to solve? What is it bringing to the table? So it basically is bringing uh, uniformity, automation, which is causes efficiency and auditability uh, to attestation sharing. That's what, what DBOM tries to address. So now when you look at like it, and it could apply to hardware, software, manufacturing, doesn't matter, but you develop something and you want to have an automated process to generate attestation or the artifacts associated with that product. Then you want to be able to store and organize them properly based on you know, the releases, minor, major releases for every single product that you provide. Then you want to have a way of being uh, have a policy-based access because you just don't want to provide the vulnerability information to your downstream customer to, uh, through an email. Because who's going to be, okay, yes, there's a target um, reader for that email, but where does it say that information? Who else can have access to that information? Because that could become a blueprint for attacks to your, to, you know, attacks to your product. So, um, so you need, it's important to be policy-based access to that information and knowing that who is accessing that information. And at the end, from the uh, consumer of that information, being able to consume that attestation in an automated way and uh, machine readable way by which they don't have to assign, you know, it streamlines the process by which they only get notified when they do want to get notified about something that is wrong. So that's what DBOM does. DBOM enables to provide these uh, what we call logical channels between the supplier of attestation and the consumer or consumers of the attestation by which they get entitled, entitled to look at some information. We don't transfer any information. We just, we, as a producer or any producer, they provide the information in their favorite repository, whether it is the blockchain, you know, the similar technology or traditional database. And then they set up these channels and then they will give uh, access to the, uh, the end individuals or entities that they have, they would like them to have access to in a very controlled way. So that's what DBOM does. Automate the generation, or, you know, provide a way to store and organize the information, provide a way uh, to enable others, entitle others to sh uh, see that information policy-based and then enable the consumer of it to consume that data on an automated way. So that's what DBOM provides. And, you know, from, you know, as you and I have over the last, what is it, three years now, 
you know, had this conversation over and over and over again, right? You know, trying to get in my own head, you know, what is an attestation? What is it different from anything else? It's the fact that someone said, and where, where are they now? And, and remember, you know, in the early days, you're looking at, you know, how are attestation shares today? Every way, you know, literally fax machines, you know, emails, everything else. You know, if you take any given case, you know, like, you know, we'll stick to that, that NMIS case. You can find that SBOM. You can find out what version of software was running on the machine tool that made it in the dirt. You could just today so, mean that you literally look through everything. And you just so look through me, the entire world. Yeah, give me an example. You want to attest that you have produced this software on this belt machine for this rev and cr cryptographically sign that you, you know, you, that, uh, you know, attest that this entity or individual or machine has generated this so they can trust at the end when you use it so that's what the attestation is all about well you know and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw a question out there that was a uh kate stewart and i proposed this as a talk at uh, this rsa it just went past apparently they have no taste they didn't pick it up because yeah we, we actually put it out there as a statement that uh um, number six, Anthony, you know, will all source code someday be available on demand to those authorized? Like Kate and I said is it's going to be, you know, it's a great contentious subject. If you say all source code on earth, which is a large enough pool to you know, instigate the, the point that I want to talk about here, all of it is going to be available to everybody who is authorized. If you have the right to see that source code, you're going to have it and you're going to have it. Right now. And that will happen at some point in the future because out of it, without that mental we can't we, you know, we can't have nice things and you know as we go through this early maturity level as we did with threat intelligence and we're middle maturity now as we're doing with supply chain right now we're early um we start worrying about you know everybody getting access to everything but you know you, as you learn on the train you find out that that if those attestations aren't that well secured probably as you thought they were anyways um which means you should probably look at your security and there's more of them. The sheer volume of this, right? You know, the, the you know, back to that uh, that uh, Air Force uh, technician. Do you know how many attestations we're talking in, in one jet? You know, one big cargo jet that's flown for 20 years, been been touched by everybody, been refueled. Each part was made by somebody. The metal of the parts were were made by people. We're not we're not talking about getting all the attestations about anything to every to anybody. We're talking so, about is linking all these attestations together so that should you need, you'll find. Uh, Ginger, your mistake is that you give us microphone between Chris and I, and we just never let anybody else to talk. But I was just going to give one more example of attestation sharing. It's related to net zero regulation. Companies need to start to provide their carbon footprints regarding their products, their assets. So when you think about it, components include other components coming from different suppliers and you need to provide that information downstream to the regulators um, the regular agencies so then the whole fact about yeah, about sharing your the information about your carbon footprint see how huge and a complex problem is and in some cases you don't want to reveal your suppliers uh, because that's you know that's a uh, private information. So that's where this, like a debunk helps, you know, by which you can set up private channels between the entities to share same information in a private that you can trust and attest to it. So I'll drop another DOE program in the mix. Um, because of that need, Medi, DOE chartered uh, Cymani, which is the Cybersecurity Manufacturing um, Innovation Institute. And their job, should they choose to accept it, and Anthony, you should play the Mission Impossible music behind me right now, is not only to work with advanced manufacturers to make products that are more secure, uh, for, for cy cyber secure than they are today, but also more energy efficient and more carbon friendly products all at the same time. Um, they figured that by, by loosening the stakes so that they're moving all the stakes at the same time, they have an opportunity through deep research to change outcomes. 
And I think you're right that an attestation environment is going to be central to them achieving goals um, and to real companies implementing some of the technologies that they're going to come up with. Um, and Chris, um, on your question about will all source code be available to everybody who sees it, um, I have a corollary question for you, and that is, will it matter? So I had a unique opportunity, part of being at a research lab is you get to touch many things that are just amazing, mind-blowing. Um, and I got to play in the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge. Um, and this was a machine versus machine hacking competition. The humans got to create the hacking bots, so to speak, but they couldn't write any of the code. They couldn't write attacks. They couldn't do the vulnerability research. They simply had to write the systems that did that work. So in the future, I have the question of, will the source code that we depend on be written directly by the humans, or will there be intermediaries that are producing couture products for my risk environment, my particular production environment, my process, how I want things so that the source code that's produced for me is A, unique to me with some attestations that guide it and of really no use to anybody else. And the intellectual property protection then moves to how does the system know how to create the code just for me and make it right? You know, mm -hmm. and Anthony, on that perfect note, put uh, question number seven up there which is basically, you know, uh, a great set of notes from talking to Ginger, right? You know, and, you know, good, look forward, you know, where is all this going? In 50 years, you know, when S-bombs are normal, how do they, you know, you, you can read results there. How do they manifest? And some of the most interesting conversations, and I, you know, in all sorts of different topics over the, over the years and the decades now, is when really interesting people go, actually, that's a good, good question, right? Yeah. Most code is not going to exist. You know, most code is going to be exactly what you said, compiled on the fly. You know, an S-bomb, I think we need to talk about quantum S-bombs. You know, Heisenberg's S-bomb, you know, it's in a box, and as long as you don't look at it, it exists, and, you know, it, it'll exist as soon as you need it to. Because in most of those instances, no, there's not going to be an actual S-bomb document created for that individual piece of code, unless maybe policy says that in those circumstances, yes, there is. But that'll there'll be a reason for that, right? Because there's an extra burden and whatnot. But you know the the enormous en enormous volume of uh, uh, of information you know continues to get larger exponentially all the time. So obviously we find a way to deal with it. So I think all of our stakeholders in this conversation, um, it's easy to get overwhelmed with how much information we're talking about, how many gigabytes, the frequency of exchange. Um, and I like to think about a mature attestation environment being as if I'm working and I'm doing risk management, but I'm accompanied by a three-year-old. And the three-year-old says, well, how and why and when and how do you know? And what makes you think that? Um, and the attestations give me the ability to look in and answer the questions of the three-year-old. Um, and so will I be doing that by reading lines of text in an email? Oh, my gosh, I hope not. Um, and this is where, if there are data scientists in the house, there are immense opportunities to shape this data into an interface. Um, I can imagine my virtual reality glasses where I begin to examine my environment and it starts to tell me about the things I'm interacting with because of the role I have and the actions I'm taking and the things that I'm doing. It knows what to tell me. Uh, all that information is in the background. And if I needed to see it, I could pull it forward. But in, in general, I would learn about the attestations that I care about. Um, and I think we'll design workplaces that are like that. Today's environment where we're talking about, you know, what's the format <clears throat> of an SBOM? What's the format of an attestation? Are there formats for generalized attestations? Are we going to stick to things that are specific? All of this is sort of the building blocks for how we get there. Um, and I'll note, I don't want to pop into our Q&A time, but uh, Vivek, you did ask a question about how this affects insurance premiums and financing. And boy, there's a big payoff there. Yeah, let me just see uh, the way I see like in I'm not even 50 years, five or 10 years. If I'm uh, security, uh, I need to manage the security of a critical infrastructure, you know, and I want to be in the morning when I get up, Look at just a number or a color 
and tells me what, how much uh, my operation is at risk today. I don't want to look at any S bombs, vulnerability data, or H bombs or anything. It tells me what it is, and that's what I at least I think we every all, many companies are going to work toward because we need that. We can't expect every operation to have many um, individuals going through these uh, data and trying to figure whether their operation is at risk or not that moment, that day. Well, I'll, uh, you know, since I'm sort of filling a dual seat, I'll, I'll uh, take this one as the, uh, as a panelist. Um, and uh, in 2050 or in 50 years from now, I think that, you know, I, I think you take a, a electric utility, right? You know, that's governed by um, regulations, you know, that are enforced by law. Um, I don't think that there'll be a lot of auditing going on, right? I think that, you know, the regulations are being acted, you know, our, our, our live code is live policy. And, you know, if you need to have SBOMs available, for, you know, on demand for classes of, of devices uh, in the infrastructure, you do. Um, yeah, I think Ginger and Mehdi, you both said similar things like this. Nobody looks at them. I mean, why would you, right? You, you know, because you know, if the device wouldn't have turned on in the first place if it didn't meet all the requirements. Um, one of the requirements is that, you know, there is legal contract or language that the supplier has already agreed in advance and their lawyers have escrowed the code perhaps or whatever it is. And, you know, should you need that, um, that'll be there. But, you know, these, there's so much manual work now. Um, like, yeah, uh, well, not in my wife, you know, we, uh, on our, on our, uh, uh, marriage certificate uh, in Canada and Ontario uh, back in 1987, for some reason, he listed job occupation. So I was a forklift driver and Don was a word processor. It used to be a job, right? The whole floors of people who were word processors. And before that, you know, before you know, all the computer stuff, calculator was a job. And I think that we do this enormous amount of paperwork and hand checking on things right now. They should just be automated and built in. So I think that's where we get with S bombs. And all these things, I think that flight engineer, you know, literally will, you know, 50 years from now, much less than that, you know, will look at with Ginger's AR glasses, with Ginger's AR glasses that will show him different things. It will show Ginger because his policy allows him to see these things. And he'll look at that blade and he'll see the things he needs to know about it. You know, and yeah, and the, the general won't, won't see any of that stuff because they need a red or blue or green because they have other things in their mind, right? So we just, I think that the biggest thing we will we'll notice is, isn't just that we made the things more secure, is that we used to do all this work. How do you, I, this match, I'm sorry to rant, you know, so much, but this match, match, match is looking backwards, right? You know, the, the, how did, how did you build cars the way they did in the 1940s? Well, because it was a different world. You couldn't do that today. You know, it takes so much time. You can build five cars, <laughs> but there were only five customers. Um, so, yeah, we're spending a lot of money doing a lot of things by hand right now that we're not going to be doing in the future. And this will impact security, you know, in, in, intrinsically, fundamentally. But maintenance is Not that I have opinions. But, okay, so putting my moderator hat back on again. Uh, uh, the, uh, in fact, uh, we mentioned the, the insurance, uh, the cyber insurance thing. So we have 12 minutes left here. You know, I would like to, to stir things up for 10 or 15, maybe in 20 years by saying, you know, among the cybersecurity people that in the end, insurance solves all cybersecurity because it does. Um, now, it's a long, interesting, complicated path. You know, there's some indications that we're getting around that time. Um you know, the, the insurance companies all have cyber insurance now, didn't used to. You know, they've all had very, very loose requirements because nobody knew what anything was about. You know, those scaled up into sort of massive, complicated things. And, you know, the general state of cyber, security, cyber insurance now is that the carriers would really like to know exactly what the risk is. And we as an industry have a heck of a, hell of a time telling them. So, yeah, yeah, you guys. I mean, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I mean, you should reduce the... Uh, premium on insurance, especially cybersecurity, because if I am, if as an insurance company, I know that the software or hardware 
produced by the suppliers for this company or all follow these steps that I have specified. For instance, a piece of code was when it was developed, it was inspected by two inspectors. It did a vulnerability scan. It you know, has gone through all these steps and then provided to the customer that I, the consumer of it that I'm uh, insuring. Theoretically, it has to go down or it has to be less cost less uh, because you're following the agreed steps process. And you can attest to it. And you have to remember that the, the insurance people are, are you know, uh, uh, accountant lawyers. It's like werewolf vampires, right? You know, it's a combination threat. And, you know, it's, it's from an insurance perspective, I can underwrite your risk if you agree with my terms. Now, that may not do you any good, but, you know, if the terms are, 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 are reasonable and, you know, you'll, you'll pay the premiums, but the, the terms may say exactly what, uh, what many just said, right? You know, that, that you require your suppliers to do these things and they in, in writing say that they did, did those things. Now, did they do those things? Don't know. From an insurance perspective, kind of don't care because if the, the thing I'm insuring happens and we go back and check on the, on the source and found out that your subcontractor didn't do it, I don't have to pay. Mm -hmm. right? Oh yeah, auditability becomes important because I can go back and audit to make sure that you know the steps were taken right yeah so yeah the, you know the linked attestation at that linked attestation you think that's hard for me to say um system that uh, that benny and i and, and others think about well you know, it, that's just it'll, it'll lower premium because it'll save time and and increase confidence you pretty is it test not the right please yeah, isn't Tesla doing that with their insurance now? They monitor how you drive and they set the premium exactly best based on your driving habit. So if they see that you speed a lot, your premium increases on a monthly basis. If you follow the uh, rules, you know, then your premium lowers. So it would be the same thing for um you know, ensuring that the companies are following agreed steps to secure the, you know, the supply chain of their software. Yeah. And I, I think that it's a slightly different case, you know, but, but uh, because with, with all sorts of cyber insurance, with linked attestations, you're, you're, I think you're saving two different types of risk and money, you know, for insurance companies, which can makes them provide the premiums a lower cost, which makes business owners like the rest of us, you know, do those things because it lowers our cost. And, and the first is just lower their cost. These, these attestation ecosystems should mean that when something happens, not only do the insurers, you know, not need to have a lot of paralegals and everybody else go back through all the records and find out, you know, if everybody stuck to their terms, because, you know, everything, if you're automating all of the terms, then they know all of that at the point. So you save all that time and all that cost on the insurance side, so I can offer you lower premiums. Um, and you know, Maddie, what you're saying, you could actually, if you're writing good terms, and you know, insurance people are really good at this. Um, you can get down to specifically what the really real bloody risk is, and lower the risk of cyber uh, incidents in the same way as the exact same me me uh, uh, mechanisms have lowered the risk of fire. Right? It works really well. You know, business owners like to pay less in insurance. Insurance companies like to pay out less for disasters. So you end up having enough, you know, less disasters. Yeah, there's one question is asking, uh, does this give the government too much control? Um, I, I give you my view, um, at least with the D-bomb, what we have in mind is that you set up private channels between entities suppliers and consumers of assets so so i don't see how we are giving too much uh control to government is just uh making the relationship between the suppliers and consumers of any assets to to be able to to follow certain agreed steps and to attest that they are following those steps so i personally can't see the role of government in this relationship between uh, companies, organizations. What do you think, Chris? And yeah, I, I think it. You know, again, two answers: choose your government wisely, 
right? You know, if if you know a government wouldn't say that we'll attest to all the actions that we take in a public forum, you know, that is highly reliable and everybody can see it all the time, um, then get a new government. Um, but I think intrinsically, like the internet, you know, an attestation ecosystem is provides options. So if you know you can centralize anything. You know, they, in SBOMs, is there going to be a central repository? Vulnerabilities, is there a central repository? That repository could be an attestation you know, uh, repository. It could be a, a DBOM channel you know, or, or something like that. But, you know, with a, what, what led to, you know, what led to DBOM, you know, was, you know, a quick conversation looking at how many organizations need to do this, how often. So, it, you know, Unisys is big, but it's not that big. It's the oldest you know, computer, computer company on earth. But this has to be done by everybody. And if everybody can manage attestations that have a fidelity, you know, that, that makes them fit for the various purposes, then you can, you could, you don't need the government control. You don't need to have the centralized uh, figure in there. You know, where's the directory for the web? There's a one. So we have lost Ginger, you know, so this, 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 is both a testament to the people in the industry and a and a, uh, uh, a plague upon our technology, right? We think our technology is all very sophisticated, um, but with life events and and uh, and technology, we've uh, gone through a lot of panelists before even getting out of this call. So, Ginger is I see in the in the chat out there. Um, before I'm done with those, I want to thank you for absolutely everything. Thank you for being a friend. You're a fantastic person. Thanks for doing all the work you do. Thanks for joining us here uh, uh, today on this. And uh, and Mehdi, if you want to hang with me for another couple of minutes, let's see what other uh, questions we had from out in the world, perhaps, that we can try to answer. Scroll through all this. Or any other smart things we can say that we hadn't covered already? Mehdi, any last statements, just things on your mind? No, I think it's uh, basically, I'm really excited with all, you know, it's like everything that is happening around SBOMs, HBOMs, vulnerability information, sharing the information, securing uh, the supply chain of software. Um, and it's just making me extremely excited. And again, going back to what you were saying three years, I think three years ago, uh, what the whole conversation started when you said, you know, I uh, interact with these uh, critical infrastructure critical infrastructure companies such as refineries. And they're telling you that they have a lot of hardware and software products, but they have no idea where do they come from, what are the components of them, and how vulnerable they are. And I'm glad to be part of um, coming up with a solution to solve that problem. It is a lot of fun. Well, thank you both for joining me, joining us today uh, for our State of Cybersecurity Industry panel. Uh, thank you to the amazing panelists. This amazing discussion. Everybody out there, please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on things and so forth and stay up to date for all future events. My name is Chris Blast. This is Benny and Tazari. We're DMOM people. And... Ginger Wright, thank you for your time. Andrew Hamilton, thank you. I uh, hope you feel better. Josh Marpet, congratulations on the baby. All the rest of you, have a good uh, have a good day. Cheers. Right. Cheers.